Today we're going to go over the PowerPoint presentation on identifying members of the human line or human lineage. This will correlate with Chapter 9 in the Explorations textbook if you're using the free textbook, or it also correlates with Chapter 9 in the Essentials textbook. The first thing we're going to examine is how do we identify or determine if a fossil is part of the human lineage instead of the ape lineage. So let's start by def defining what it means to be a hominin. A hominin is a member of the group that includes humans and our fossil relatives since the point at which we split from the other apes. Based on genetic evidence, which we also call molecular evidence, as well as fossil evidence, it is believed that the split happened somewhere between five to seven million years ago. Bipedalism is considered to be the foundational or the hallmark characteristic of what it means to be human meaning that this is the very first characteristic that split us from the rest of the apes. The earliest bipedal hominins that date between 6 and 3 million years ago display anatomical evidence for what we call habitual bipedal locomotion. Habitual bipedal locomotion means that these hominins were likely bipedal when traveling on the ground or when they were standing on branches to reach higher hanging fruit. However, they retained some arboreal climbing abilities. So, for example, an example of a habitual biped would be Artipithecus romidus, which dates back about 4.4 million years ago. This particular fossil displays what we call a mosaic anatomy. You're going to hear that term mosaic come up quite a bit over the next few chapters. That term mosaic means mixture of, so when we're talking about mosaic fossils, it means that those fossils display a mixture of primitive or older traits and newer or more derived traits. Artipithecus romidus has a pelvis, a pelvic girdle, and the ilium. The top half of the pelvis looks much more like a biped, more rounded and bowl-shaped, and the bottom half of the pelvis looks more like a quadruped. Um, so the pelvic girdle in itself is quite literally a mosaic aspect of Artipithecus's anatomy because the top half is more like a biped, bottom half is more like a quadruped. Additionally, the phalanges, the finger bones, and the toe bones are longer and slightly curved, which would have allowed for more effective gripping of branches. The hallux, or the big toe, is also opposable, which is allowing for gripping of branches. Once you finish viewing this PowerPoint presentation, please watch the Howard Hughes Medical Institute short film clip on the evolution of bipedalism. You can click on it here from this PowerPoint presentation, or you can also access from this, from this week's module. Let's look at the three different types of bipedalism. The three different types are occasional bipedalism, habitual bipedalism, and obligate bipedalism. Occasional bipedalism is bipedal locomotion that is practiced sometimes. So occasional bipeds are going to rely on other forms of locomotion as their primary means or modes of movement, and they resort to bipedalism under certain circumstances. So good examples of this would be modern-day chimpanzees and bonobos. Chimpanzees and bonobos are predominantly knuckle walkers and brachiators. Um, knuckle walking is a form of quadrupedal locomotion, meaning that they're moving on all fours. However, both chimpanzees and bonobos have been observed to be bipedal under certain circumstances, such as standing on branches to reach higher hanging fruit, like you see this chimp in the top picture doing, or sometimes they might stand bipedally when walking through water using a stick as a tool. Uh, they may stand bipedally on the ground if they're carrying something such as a handful of food, or if they're using a tool, or if they're carrying infants. So occasional bipeds are bipeds that are utilizing other forms of locomotion as well. The next type is going to be a habitual biped. Habitual bipedalism is bipedal locomotion that is practiced regularly. However, these bipeds also rely on other forms of locomotion. So they're using bipedalism and arboreal climbing equally. So it is likely that our earliest bipedal ancestors were habitual bipeds. So again, we're going to see this very mosaic anatomy, mixed anatomy, that's indicating that these early hominins utilize both forms of locomotion. So some examples that we're going to review in this PowerPoint, as well as in the chapter coming up, are Artipithecus romidus, nickname is Artie, and Australopithecus afarensis, nickname is Lucy. 
So you'll even see here in this picture, this is an, a representation of the Ardipithecus rhombidus fossil. So when you look at this fossil, it's extremely mosaic. The arms are much longer than you would expect in a typical biped. The finger bones, the phalanges are longer and curved, which is allowing for that retention of arboreal climbing and possibly some degree of brachiation. Um, and then other features are indicating that they also utilize bipedalism. The pelvis, the top half is much more like a biped bottom half is much more like a quadruped. The femur is longer and angled inward towards the knee. We call that the bicondylar angle. Um, so it really is, this fossil is a very mosaic transitional fossil. Um, the next type of bipedalism is obligate bipedalism. So this is really homo erectus and onward. So the earliest bipeds, so essentially um, the, those hominins that date 6 million to about 3 million years ago are habitual bipeds, and then those hominins that are um, 1.8 million years ago to present, these are obligate bipeds. So obligate bipedalism is bipedal locomotion that is practiced exclusively. Um, obligate bipeds do not rely on other forms of locomotion. We see evidence for a commitment to obligate bipedalism with Homo erectus and onward. So we actually won't get to, we won't get to Homo erectus fossils until two chapters from now. But just to give you a little preview of what's coming next, we're going to see with Homo erectus that they are fully adapted to bipedal locomotion. Their femurs are long and angled inward towards the knee. There's going to be a feature on the back called the linea aspera that allows for the attachment of the ligaments and muscles that are important for bipedal locomotion, both walking and running. Um, also, the pelvis is going to be overall short and broad, and the pelvic inlet, essentially the birth canal for female hominins, is going to be more narrow, which made childbirth more dangerous and complicated, which is one of those evolutionary trade-offs that came along with bipedal locomotion. All right, so let's look next at some of the anatomical or physical changes that we're going to see. So we'll look first at the foramen magnum. This slide just kind of introduced the five features we're going to look at, and then we'll talk about them in more detail in the next slides. The second feature will be the vertebral column. Third feature will be the pelvic girdle, and especially the top half, the ilium. Uh, feature four will be the thigh bone or the femur. And then feature five will be the hallux, the big toe, and then also the phalanges, the hand bones and the finger bones. All right, so foramen magma and postorbital constriction. These are cranial features that we're going to look at when we're comparing apes versus humans. Um, so apes, again, are predominantly quadrupeds, even though, of course, some apes do practice occasional bipedalism. So we're going to see a posterior or more in the back position of the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum is the hole where the spinal column will connect to the skull. The location of maximum skull breadth, so when you turn a skull around and look at it from the back, is going to be the, the widest point will be more at the base of the skull. Um, also, we're going to see presence of what we call post-orbital constriction. And we'll talk more about that here in the next slide when we can see a picture. And then bipeds or hominins are going to have a more anterior or directly underneath position of the foramen magnum. The location of the maximum skull breadth is going to move higher, especially once we get into genus Homo, um, onward to Homo sapiens. And postorbital constriction will decrease as cranial capacity expands, especially the expansion of the frontal region of the brain. This picture here gives you a good comparison. Um, you're going to utilize this in this lab as well as in, um, in future lab, uh, both lab 14, 15, and 16. You'll be exploring postorbital constriction. So this picture here on the far left, this is an example of an australopithecine. Postorbital constriction is talking about how far it sinks in behind the brow. So the orbits, the orbits are the eye sockets, the supraorbital ridge, that's the brow ridge, and then postorbital constriction is talking about how far does it sink in behind the brow. So with the Australopithecines, you're going to see a relatively high degree or extreme degree of postorbital constriction. Essentially what that means is that you're looking at a relatively small brained hominin, especially the frontal region of the brain. Um, this is an example, this is Homo erectus here, this is the Pekin man fossil. 
So you see you've got some pretty pronounced superorbital ridges here, brow ridges, and you've got constriction, but it's not nearly as extreme as you're going to see with the Australopithecines. And then this picture here on the far right is a modern Homo sapiens. So modern Homo sapiens have no constriction behind the brow, and everybody can feel, everybody feel from your brow all the way up to your forehead, and you see it goes straight up. It doesn't sink in behind the brow. Um, so we'll look at this in the continuing chapters. All right, so the vertebral column is the next anatomical feature we'll look at at quadrupeds versus bipeds. So quadrupeds have a C-shaped vertebral column, and all of their individual vertebrae are relatively the same size because quadrupeds are, a quadrupedal ape is supporting about the same amount of weight with each vertebrae. And then in comparison, a biped or a hominin is going to have more, as an, more of an S-shaped curvature to the vertebral column, and the lumbar or lower back vertebrae are going to be much larger because they're supporting much more weight. Um, lumbar and thoracic back pain is still one of the number one reasons that modern humans visit a general practitioner. So you could even argue that Six million, six million years later, we're not necessarily perfectly adapted to bipedal locomotion. All right, the pelvis is another big one. This is another one that we oftentimes find pelvic bones with, with fossil hominins. So the pelvis is another really key feature that we're going to look at if we're determining, if we're looking at a quadruped or a pongid or more of a bipedal hominin. So quadrupeds are going to have an overall shape of the pelvis that is more long and narrow. The birth canal for a quadruped, this is a chimp pelvis here, is going to be much wider in comparison. So for a chimpanzee, birth is, is not as dangerous or complicated. Not to say it's not painful, but it's not quite as dangerous or complicated as you would see with a modern human. And then a biped, the overall shape of the pelvis is going to be short and broad. You might also see it sometimes called bowl-shaped. The iliac blades here are going to kind of curve in. So that's that short, broad shape and overall bowl-shaped shape of the pelvis. Uh, the birth canal, the pelvic inlet, is relatively narrow. So again, that's one of those evolutionary trade-offs of bipedal locomotion. Next feature we're going to look at is the femur. This is another one that we oftentimes, you know, sometimes we are lucky enough to recover the femur of fossil hominins. So if the femur is longer and angled inward towards the knee, it's much more likely that you're looking at a biped. And then if the femur is shorter and straighter, then you're much more likely looking at a quadruped. Another feature that we're going to look at is called the Linnea aspera. That's a ridge that's on the posterior, the back end of the femur. Um, this ridge, the Linnea aspera, is present in bipeds and not present in quadrupeds. All right, last anatomical feature we'll look at is the hallux and also the phalanges. The hallux is the big toe and the phalanges are the finger and the toe bones. So quadrupeds have an opposable hallux. This is a chimp foot here, so you can see the opposable hallux in a chimp. Um, that allows for gripping of branches for arboreal or tree-dwelling locomotion. Um, the metatarsals, metatarsals are the foot bones, and the phalanges are the toe bones. So the metatarsals and phalanges are longer and have a slight curvature, which is, again, allowing for a more effective gripping of the branches. So this is a chimp here. This is a modern human. Uh, this is Homo habilis, and then this is Artipithecus romitus. So Artipithecus is, again, one of those mosaic fossils. So you're seeing an opposable hallux, which indicates that this is a habitual biped, not an obligate biped. So Artipithecus is bipedal in some circumstances, but retains some of those abilities to brachiate and locomote in the trees. Um, bipeds, especially those two million years and to present, are adapted for long distance walking and running. The hallux, the big toe, is in line with the rest of the toes. And we also have ligaments that bind our foot into arches. These are kind of, these serve as shock absorbers during bipedal walking and running. So we're going to go ahead and pause here. In the next presentation, we're going to look at the various theories as to why bipedal locomotion emerged.